Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the second Wednesday of the month, which means it's time for our plant-based cardiologist, Dr. Baxter Montgomery. And today he's going to be talking about whether or not you can actually lose too much weight on a plant-based diet. Please welcome him back to the show. Well, this is the opposite of what we usually talk about. <laughs> Well, welcome. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, the thing is, um, this came to mind the other week because over the last, I guess, several weeks, we've had a number of our clients who complain about this issue. And, you know, I thought to myself, you know, I haven't done a show on this, uh, but uh, I think it'd be great to discuss. Now, the whole issue of weight loss, and I, now we're we're tackling the the concept of of losing too much weight, um, and and I want to step back uh, from that issue of too much weight and just sort of think about weight itself. Um, and so, how much someone weighs is a, is is a is a factor of a lot of different things, uh, and of course, your body composition has an important factor, which is probably more important than total body weight or BMI composition, more muscle mass, the more hydration that's intracellular, intravascularly, you know, so the composition and where that, you know, your, your fluid stores are stashed and, 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 and that type of thing is more important than, you know, what your total body weight is or the BMI. But having said that, the whole issue of weight does come up. Most often it's in a situation where people have too much weight and they're trying to lose some weight. But in our practice, we see a significant number of people who are very chronically ill who are underweight. Now, they may have systemic inflammatory disease, sarcoidosis. Uh, they may have, you know, cancer. Uh, they may have, you know, lupus and, and various other chronic illnesses that put them in a debilitated state that could contribute to weight loss. And we just have people who are genetically predisposed to being smaller, who may have a tendency to lose weight when they're sicker than to gain weight when they're sicker. So the whole issue of weight is one where we have to think of as sort of an outward manifestation of something. And, and, and obesity by itself is not the cause of chronic illness, but obesity in and of itself is one of many manifestations of chronic illness. And so the reason I, I, I state that because someone who's chronically ill and obese uh, you can also have someone who's chronically ill and who's underweight. And so their one of their manifestations of chronic illness would be, you know, excess weight loss or being underweight in part due to the illness, be it cancer or an inflammatory disease or the like. So I want to approach this whole concept that can you lose too much weight on a plant-based diet, not from the standpoint of saying, okay, you want to lose more weight and not lose more weight, but I want to talk about it in the context of what happens in the context of a plant-based diet, or what happens when you go into a nutritional excellence dietary regimen. And what we see uh, is that the body rebuilds itself. So it goes into repair. There's a remodeling process. And so just as you can understand when you remodel a house, uh, there's a process by which you tear it down, you, you gut it. And, you know, the sheetrock, you know, comes out. And, and so the house looks more dilapidated and, and, and more impaired, physically impaired, than in a situation where uh, you're building up a house from scratch. So if you build a house from scratch, you have the foundation and the framing. So there's a progressive, you know, increase in uh, the beauty of the house, the progressive increase of form, the shape and size. But remodeling is sort of a, 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 a degradation, if you will. So it may look you know, smaller. It, it may look more dilapidated because there's a rebuilding process. Well, the body does the same thing or something very similar, I should say. And so someone who may come in at normal weight uh, or even who are underweight uh, may actually lose weight before they then start to regain weight. And oftentimes uh, our clients are worried about that and you know, we have to explain that to them. And the, the important thing to understand is that weight in and of itself and by itself is not the sole marker of your health. 
Uh, you can be very thin and very unhealthy. You can be very thin and be healthy. You can be overweight, but in the trajectory of getting healthier and be healthier than somebody who's underweight in the trajectory of getting unhealthy. So it depends on the direction you're moving in terms of your health journey. Uh, and so your, your body weight at any one given point in time is not the total uh, uh, picture of your overall health um, uh, uh, progress or your overall health in, in and of itself. So this is something that you know, I found to be pretty important. It's something that you know, we see often. So uh, for an example, in the case series, we just recently submitted for publication uh, there were two patients we had who were underweight. Uh, there was one who's an 82-year-old uh, lady who had um, multiple heart attacks. She'd had stents. Uh, she was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. Uh, she had an ejection fraction, which is the percent blood that the heart pumps out uh, in each contraction, each beat uh, of 20%. So her heart was you know, beating at 20%. Uh, she had about two stents, maybe three stents placed in her heart, you know, emergently. Her cardiologist had, you know, given her, uh, started her on a melanone infusion, which is a, a medication that forces the heart to contract, you know, more forcefully and sent her home to die. They had given her two months to die. She had a BMI of roughly, um, I think, between 16 and 17. Uh, when we saw her, she was in a wheelchair on oxygen, uh, and, you know, we started on a plant-based diet. Now, she didn't do 100% raw. She did mostly raw at the beginning. We had some cook that was out of preference. Uh, but she lost weight. She lost, I think, maybe six pounds or eight pounds. Her BMI went down by one or two points. So she was even smaller uh, after about a period of, say, I'm thinking a month or so. However, despite the fact she was you know, even more underweight and, and you may look and say, well, she was probably more emaciated, she was getting stronger. She was out of the wheelchair. She was walking without the oxygen. She had gotten to the point where she was able to you know, walk on the beach with her daughter, climb up in the pickup truck uh, and do all of these things. And, and we saw even recently in, in the office and she's walking the entire mall you know, these large malls we have here. She's walking the malls, no oxygen. She's, you know, picking up things. She's more mentally alert. Uh, she's independent, you know, and she's 83 now. And uh, this is someone who was given up to die about 18 months ago. Uh, and now she's independent, getting out, moving about, and she's stronger. Now, where's her weight? Uh, she's still underweight. <laughs> and so she may have gained back some of the weight that she lost, but what she did gain is her physiology, and she gained some strength. Uh, she gained independence. Her biochemistry is more in balance. Her physiology is more in balance. And she's much healthier now, despite being underweight. So that's an example of someone who started underweight because they were very ill, lost weight during a nutritional detox, Gained a little bit of a back, but remains underweight. Uh, but despite being underweight, she's much stronger and 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 physiologically in better health than she was when she had heavier weight. Now we can get into the cosmetic issues, we can get into psychological issues, uh, and I think those things are are important as well because the psychology of this whole process uh, can have a big impact on how uh, patients uh, do. But uh, this is something where you have a person who was underweight, lost weight, but got healthier despite that. Uh, another patient in a similar case series, a uh, similar story, uh, decompensated heart failure. She got on the detox. I think she lost close to 10 pounds. BMI went down. Uh, she remained on the border of the lower end of normal to underweight by based on the BMI scale. But she, too, also got strong and became healthier, uh, did not require a surgical procedure to upgrade her defibrillator uh, because she, you know, her heart got stronger, she got stronger, she became stronger, 
And so both of these patients became healthier despite starting at a level of being underweight and even losing weight and then coming back and doing better. Um, several messages to underscore this. One, uh, obesity isn't the only cause of illness. And I, I, I say that directly because people think that, well, if you just lose weight, uh, your high blood pressure go away. If you just lose weight, your diabetes will get better. If you just lose weight, uh, other things will get better. It's, weight loss is extremely important, but it's, it's an important uh, because it's another outward manifestation of your chronic illness. So it's a good thing to gauge to see that you're getting better. So if someone comes in, they're unhealthy, they're obese, and they start to have lifestyle changes and improvement. Well, guess what? The easiest thing to measure is their weight. And to see them improve in that marker tells you that, hey, other things may be improving as well. But it's not the only uh, a marker. And, 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 and certainly in, in our situation, we have to look at many other factors uh, because in our situation, we have individuals who are so chronically ill that they have to be very precise on a nutritional regimen because if they cheat a small amount, they may still lose weight, but they may not cheat, achieve all of the health benefits such as blood pressure control, heart failure control, et cetera. And so we have to look at many other parameters than just weight loss. And so that's a, a good point. So I wanted to bring that up and share that with you and your audience. Uh, and uh, I, I guess you don't get too many of these people uh, knocking on your door. Is that right, Chef? Oh, I, I really haven't. You know, there's a commenter who's watching on Instagram that said, you know, I went on a plant-based diet and it was low fat and I lost too much weight. So I had to add, you know, nuts and seeds and avocado back in. And it just seems to me, at least most of the people that I meet have the opposite problem. They, they claim that they can't lose weight on a plant-based diet or they lose weight and they gain it back. So I, I haven't encountered the person that has lost too much weight, not yet, but I'm not a doctor. But the, <laughs> no, that's not, and, and again, you know, people go to you for weight loss, and I understand that. But you know, the thing is that um, it's, I mean, weight loss is the more challenging thing for most people. So, I mean, we, that's the case in, in our, our business too. Most people, you know, uh, can't lose enough weight. And so I'm not going to say that, hey, we're overwhelmed with people who are losing too much weight or who are underweight. We have a significant number of those people. And it's something that we have to address, but we still have a situation where the majority of people who, you know, they want to lose more weight, they're not losing weight fast enough. And to those people, I, I, I ask them to understand the fact that the body heals itself in multiple different ways. In uh, one of our earlier studies, when we looked at, we compared weight loss to other uh, improvements uh, we found a correlation for every five to six percent body weight loss. There was roughly about a thirty percent improvement or reduction in inflammation. So there's a six-fold reduction in inflammation compared to weight loss. Now that's important as it as it turns out for your internal organs, uh, you know, your heart, kidneys, etc., and how well they they function, uh, how well they function to tissue and the cellular level. So. You know, keep in mind, if you're not losing enough weight, what you have to understand, take that percentage of weight loss and multiply it times six, and you can probably get a good estimate in terms of how much you're improving in other ways. And that's important to know. What do you advise your patients that, because if I understand you correctly, a lot of these people that are losing too much weight, they didn't come into you plant-based. That's correct. They didn't come in plant-based. So they're eating, you know, uh, chicken and fish. And oftentimes, you know, um, you know, sometimes I have a friendly banter with them because they'll come in and say, well, doctor, you know, I'm kind of small as it is. And so uh, I don't want to lose too much weight. And so uh, I'm too thin as it is. I don't lose too much weight. And I say, well, well, you know, chicken and fish isn't keeping the weight on. So maybe you should try something else. You know, it's, you know, I'll joke with them in that regard, but I get to the point with them where I say, look, your weight loss is important, but these other health issues are also important and in certain cases more important. So the fact that you're too thin and you want to make sure you're, you know, still look sexy in a bathing suit, whatever the case may be, 
is okay, but we want to make sure that your heart and kidneys and everything is working fine so that you're not looking sex in the bathing suit in the CCU. Uh, and so that's the important thing that I try to convey to them. And then usually that message uh, um, gets home and they tend to, to comply. And part of it also is there's a psychological aspect, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, you know, most people are around other people who are heavy. And so you get that um, uh, impression that, hey, you know, heavy is a little bit is normal. And, and, and it plays on our psyche. We, we're around people who are heavy all the time. And so it gets to be what looks normal. And so, you know, individuals who are thin, they're already thinner than most of their family members and friends. And so they have a somewhat of a complex there. So they're trying to keep up with whatever, you know, uh, curves or whatever they may have. Uh, and so if they get thinner, then they feel even worse. Yeah, so we try to help them go with that psychological. Is that something you hear? Or? That is a very good point. And, I, and I, I can't remember the guest, but I believe they were a psychologist on the show saying something to the effect of, we develop our worldview of what is normal by those around us. And if if more than three-fourths of everyone around us are overweight or obese, those that are not really stick out. I, I think of that movie, Wall-E. Do you remember that movie? Well, I remember wall -E, but how about The Monsters? <laughs> I meant the fact that you, me you remember like at the end how everybody was just, uh, you know, quite large and in a recliner and drinking soda and, uh, you know, and that's it's what it's become normal now, you know. I may need to look that movie up, Wally, but 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 but, but so the, the the movie example I use, remember the Herman monsters when when the course and they go, the family got Herman, uh, the monster, oh, the monsters where Marilyn, who was the beautiful one, was was considered the odd and unattractive one. Yes, I I know what you're talking about. Exactly. So we don't have a lot of Marilyn's right now. There was there's a Twilight Zone episode just like that. The one where they all have pig faces and the beautiful. Do you remember that? I, I remember. Yeah, I've seen that Twilight Zone. Before, right. So, yeah. so. So, yeah, it's it's interesting because people are so sensitive about fat shaming now, but but people get thin shamed all the time, too. You know, thin shame. That's right. That's right. And and psychologically, that thin shame, even though no one's, you know, calling them out on it or calling them names, it's sort of in their subconscious if they're around people who are heavier and they see that as attractive. And so, yeah, we've dealt with that a fair amount. And, uh, you know, and I've dealt with that. And, and again, the examples I gave you were patients who came in who were underweight, but I have patients who are normal weight. They're like, their BMIs are like in the middle range of normal, or maybe upper range of normal. Again, not the BMI is the end all be all, but the point is, you know, they'll come in with a normal BMI thinking that they're too small. And so, you know, having to get over that psychology uh, is, is important because, you know, overall your health is going to be critical. Yeah. Um, What's interesting is in your protocols, because you have different stages of of the diet, depending on how sick the patient is. And in your most, I think it's, it's your, I don't remember which stage it is. It's been a while since I read your book, but it's mostly raw and people can really lose quite a bit of weight on your, on your strictest protocol. That's right. They can lose quite a bit, especially when we add time restricted eating to it. Uh, and it, they can. And uh, again, it's accelerating the health. And a lot of the weight loss, people have to understand, is a, a loss of excess fluid, a loss of excess edema. Uh, fat cells, which can all burn off as well, uh, can be reduced because these are the cells that hold the toxins. And so when the body's cleansing and, and removing toxins, it has less need for these uh, uh, toxic fat cells. And so those are depleted as well. So yes, that's the most rapid uh, phase of weight loss, and that's the most critical aspect of it in terms of, you know, getting people from, you know, uh, one point to another in terms of their health journey. But most of the times, individuals do quite well uh, early on psychologically. It's a problem, but at some point, they get used to their normal size. Their relatives and friends get used to their normal size. And one thing you have to remember, early phase of a detox, you know, you can look a, a bit emaciated because that's that remodeling process. And the body starts to fill out a bit more once you've gotten past that. Uh, and so even though you may not go back to the previous weight that you were before you started a healthier lifestyle, you'll go back to an appearance of someone who's who's not emaciated, if you will, uh, or, 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 you know, 
severely nutrient depleted. <laughs> you know, uh, Kathy, who's watching live on YouTube said, I've actually been struggling with trying to gain a few pounds. My vegan doctor recommended it to me as my BMI has dropped too low. Dr. Montgomery, what is too low? You know, that's a great question. Too low is um, a size where you cannot perform your normal activity. So for instance, you know, I guess if you want to be a sumo wrestler, then, you know, uh, too low may be anything less than 50. Um, but, um, you know, too low depends on what you want to do. Like the, the example I gave that first patient I talked about, her BMI was, I think uh, it's still around 16 and a half or something like that. Uh, is that too low? Uh, not necessarily, uh, because... She's functioning at a much higher level. She's independent. She's able to walk where she wants to walk. She can do, I mean, 83, and her health continues to get better. So a BMI of 16.5, is that too late for her, low for her? She can lift things. She's stronger than she was when a BMI was right around 17 and a half. So that's not too low in my book for that patient. So I think one has to put it in the context of, the patient or the individual, I should say, and in terms of what they want to achieve. Uh, you know, again, if, if uh, I remember, what's his name, uh, Carter uh, with the Chicago Bears when he went plant-based, uh, he was, uh, I think, a defensive lineman, maybe an offensive lineman. Well, he has to maintain a certain amount of weight if you're an offensive lineman. So a BMI less than, you know, 35 or 40 may be too low for one of those guys. Uh, so they, if they're going to eat a plant-based diet, yeah, they have to manipulate things and and beef up the calories uh, to maintain weight because that they need that weight to perform their job. So too too high, too low is a relative term. We we often create these ranges and they're arbitrary, uh, but we also have to when it comes to to applying it to an individual, then one has to say, okay, what. What are the objectives of your life and your health goals? And then whatever those are, let's meet those first. And wherever the BMI lands, that's where it lands. That's nice. Uh, Catherine's saying, I can't lose any. I'm thinking she might be referring to she can't lose any weight. What do you, what do you say to those patients? Well, we have to look at the details. Um, you know, one, what are you eating exactly? What time are you eating? Where are you procuring your food? Because... Uh, the vast real of people having trouble waiting, I mean, losing weight, uh, it gets down to that. Now, there's the other biological factors. If your microbiome has not changed significantly, uh, <laughs> you may have to do some drastic things to change your microbiome. It's not as simple as taking a probiotic, but you may have to do more aggressive detoxes, more aggressive cleanses, because oftentimes people may have, you know, abnormal bacteria and mucus and things like that in a gastrointestinal tract. And it, it leads for an abnormal uh, uh, microbiome and, and your biology is in such that you lose weight. Uh, so that can affect weight loss. Sometimes you have to look at thyroid function and other hormonal factors that may uh, play a role in impeding your weight loss. And so these are all things that we have to take into consideration uh, when we're looking at uh, weight loss in, in its totality. Uh, and then look at the amount of muscle mass you have. Now, the more muscle mass you have, the higher your metabolism, it increases your weight uh, more so than in, in increasing fat. So someone who's relatively thin can have, be relatively heavier uh, than what their perceived uh, BMI is because they're much leaner and have more muscle mass. On the flip side, someone who's heavier uh, and has uh, very minimal muscle mass but have a high fat content the basal metabolic rate is not going to be as high. So somebody may benefit from more exercise and building more muscle while also uh, calorie restricting because the more muscle mass you have, the more weight you lose even in the resting state. So you have to also look at body composition as well and how you manipulate body composition. Great. Here's a question from Carol. How can we avoid hair loss while losing weight on a vegan diet? Well, look at me, and I'm the hair loss expert, right? <laughs> uh, you, you, um, <laughs> but, you know, the things you want to do, micronutrient levels you want to look at, hormones you want to look at, 
So it's not just a vegan diet, not a vegan diet. I think a lot goes into uh, our environment. So what happens with your uh, micronutrients from the standpoint of uh, what you're consuming? Uh, so, for example, I was on a, a panel with Dr. Nathan Bryan, and we're talking about um, um, nitric oxide. And he shared something I wasn't aware of. He said, you know, because you get organically grown uh, vegetables, greens, but because of the bacteria and the limit of, of, of uh, nitrogen in the soil for for to qualify for organically grown, um, the organic greens may have less nitrite in it than, say, something grown uh, conventionally. Uh, and so you want to look at the micronutrient um, uh, component, a composition of the food that you're consuming. And more importantly, you want to look at your own micronutrient composition. Are you deficient in certain you know, B vitamins and other types of nutrients that's having an abnormal effect on your hormones that could be affecting uh, hair growth and the like? So there are a variety of things that we have to look at biochemically. So it's not just plant-based and not plant-based, but you have to take a deeper look in terms of how you're nourishing your body because we all have many different deficits based on this polluted environment we're in. You know, are there toxic metals in your system uh, that's having an adverse effect on your hormones and your other biochemical uh, processes? Great, thank you. Here's a question from... I got to get glasses. Looks like Colleen. What tests do you recommend to do each year as a marker of overall good health? Oh, my goodness. Well, first of all, there's no one test that I would use. So it's really a composition of things. And, and I like to break them down into compartments. So you want to look at something that looks at biochemistry. Um, you know, some basic blood test that's easily done. Uh, basic chemistries that look at... Um, you know, kidney function, uh, acid base levels. So, comprehensive metabolic panel can look at a lot of those things. Gets a cursory look at liver enzymes, uh, the blood count, uh, a CBC complete blood count looks at you know your hemoglobin hematocrit, uh, your white count. If the white count's not you know on the high normal side, that implies that you're not you know uh, have an underlying inflammatory process by whatever means or source. Um, those are some very, very simple tests that, you know, almost any doctor can order. Uh, you get into cholesterol levels also, which is another simple test, a uh, basic lipid panel. So these are very simple tests that just about anyone can do. Now, in our center, we look at things a little bit deeper. We look at inflammatory markers. We look at ultra-sensitive troponin because of our population. Uh, people have lots of heart disease or ischemia. Uh, we look at uh, micronutrient tests, intracellular micronutrients, uh, because even before you have an outward manifestation of a chronic illness, the micronutrients uh, may be um, uh, deficient in certain areas, and you can start to target, uh, replace those, and and prevent uh, you know worsening of other conditions. Uh, beyond that, then that's the biochemistry side. We then look at uh, some of the physiological things. Um, we do an echocardiogram. We do an ultrasound. We look at, you know, the vascular flow and the lower extremities, uh, look at the performance of the heart. Uh, we'll do a, a, an exercise treadmill stress test to look at the body's blood pressure and heart rate response to exercise. So these are basic physiological things uh, that we look at. Pretty soon we're going to start to look at VO2 max in, in a slightly more advanced uh, way. But this looks at then the physiology. So how well is the body functioning at the physiological level? So the blood work and some of those things look at the biochemistry and these things look at the physiology. And then, you know, the overall well-being of our patient. This isn't a certain test, um, but uh, we plan to in the future do a questionnaire. And it's overall, you know, well question of well-being. How well are you functioning? How well are you uh, 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 doing your family status, you know, mood and that type of things. These things also they look at the psychosocial things. So the point, I mean, you asked for one test, I gave you, you know, a dissertation on a lot of different things, but the human body is, we're all very complex. And so it, there's no one test that gives a whole picture. In fact, one test can probably do more to confuse you uh, and mislead you than it can to inform you. 
Thank you. Here's a very nice comment from one of your patients named Pat. And she says, I'm currently under Dr. Montgomery's care and see his nutritional nutritionist once a month. My blood pressure is better. I've lost 13 pounds in almost two months. The weight loss is a bonus. I just want to be healthy and being healthy means being proactive. We have to be committed to a healthy lifestyle, which is what I love about Dr. Montgomery. So I don't know if she lives in Houston or if you see people virtually, but that's a wonderful testimony. Yeah, both. We see people virtually. We have a community where you have people that's international and they communicate with our people online. Uh, and and many people fly in periodically, get treatments and go back home and then we follow them. So there's a variety of things that we do. That's neat. I didn't know you had a nutritionist. Is like, like is that somebody on your staff, like a registered dietitian or something like that? Well, we have two nutritionists. Uh, we call them our life source coordinators. They have a background in nutrition and wellness. One is a naturopathic doctor background. The other one's a background nutrition undergrad. Mm -hmm. uh, and we haven't done two. We've had some uh, registered dietitians, maybe two or three. I haven't been so successful with uh, the the um, registered dietitians uh, for I don't know for different reasons. But right now we're doing quite well with the two we have, and we'll probably bring a third one on as we get busier. That's great. Oh, he, you know, here's a, actually, this is a really good question. Not that the other question worked good, but Connie mm -hmm. says, <laughs> if, but I hear this one a lot and I don't know the answer. If my weight is good, but my body composition is over 30% fat, what is the best way to get rid of it? Because I don't want to lose too much more weight. That's a great question. Essentially, what you want to do is build muscle mass. Uh, so you want to lift weights, you want to build muscle mass, you want to strengthen your body. Um, it's oftentimes good to get a trainer who can give you guidance along these lines uh, in terms of building strength. But so what you want to do is you want to measure your strength today and say, okay, I want to improve my strength by 50% in this period of time and another 50% in that period of time. And, and ideally you want to get with a, a, a trainer, a, a certified trainer who can guide you along those lines because as you build muscle mass and your metabolism increases, uh, and of course, we're going to make the assumption that you're eating a uh, healthy, uh, plant-based, non-processed food diet. As you do those things, plus get, get hydration, then you'll find that uh, you'll lose fat and build muscle. Thank you. That's what Rich said. Okay, here is another question. Uh, but I'm um... Okay. Uh, Scout says, since I ate the standard American diet for 65 years, should I have a calcium score done? I wonder how much damage I did to my arteries most of my life. I've eaten whole food plant-based for seven years at the age of 72, and I'm now feeling great. You know, it wouldn't hurt. It depends on your risk factors. So for example, the standard American diet is one. If there are a long history of family members who've uh, consumed or who've had heart disease, or if you had other risk facts like elevated cholesterol or the like, it wouldn't hurt to do a calcium score. You know, again, a lot goes into that decision, but generally speaking, you can do a calcium score. I actually like to do uh, a calcium score with a CT corneal angiogram. Now, the center we look at, because you can have a very low, I've seen people with very low calcium scores, even a zero, but have significant plaque. In fact, we've seen a number of people with like a zero calcium score, or calcium score one, but they'll have like a 50% plaque that appears to be, you know, sort of a vulnerable plaque. And so that person can have a calcium score of zero one and still have a heart attack uh, if that plaque is not stabilized. And so you want to make sure you're nourishing the body in a proper way. Thank you. And question, I guess it helps if you put four question marks first. Okay, uh, where did it go? It was about portion sizes. Somebody saying, yeah, not sure on what portion size you should be. Definitely don't eat too much. Might be eating too little as I can't lose weight. What I love about the plant-based diet, at least the way I follow it, which is low calorie density, you know, without, you know, sugar, oil, and salt and flour and alcohol is I, I don't. I eat huge portions and I was able to get lean and stay lean. Yeah. Yeah. You should be able to eat to satisfaction. I think that's the key with the diet. Just the way I'd like to think of it is if you look at these um, the movies and uh, the, the the wild kingdom, you see like the, the gorillas and these guys are out eating. 
Uh, maybe they're grabbing bananas or leaves or whatever they're eating uh, or the deer they're eating. Uh, you don't see it with measuring cups or scales. Or anything. They're just eating uh, because they're eating the food that's right for their body. So there's no need to measure it. When their body says, I'm satisfied, they're satisfied. They have enough. And so that's the way it should be left. If you, if, for instance, if you're consuming poison, then you have to measure it very carefully. And so we've gotten to where our diet, the standard American diet is so poisonous. That's why I had to get into this whole issue of portion size. Because if, if just think of it this way, if, if 10 drops of cyanide will kill you and seven drops of cyanide would make you very sick, and five drops of cyanide you can have and not get too sick or die. You would have to carefully count the drops of cyanide if you're eating cyanide and drink, consuming cyanide every day. But if you're consuming something that's not poisonous, then you don't have to measure it. So it's the poisonous food that require measuring, not the food that's ideal for the body because it's going to nourish the body properly and your body's going to register to satisfaction when it's got received enough. I love that. We were once at a conference together and I was... I believe Dr. Campbell and Dr. Lyle were on the panel with you, and we got a similar question like that. And you said something to the effect of, you never see a gazelle on the African savanna worrying about whether or not they should eat another blade of grass. That's right. Because <laughs> if you're eating the right food, it doesn't have to be weighed and measured. Right. No? Right. Have to, exactly. You have, you have to measure the poison, but not the healthy food. Exactly. Like that's why some of these weighing and measuring programs, they limit people to like seven ounces of vegetables. And that just seems such a dismal amount when I, I mean, I eat like when I eat broccoli, the whole bag, it's a pound. Like I don't, I'm not weighing it. It just happens to say a pound on it. That's how. Yeah, I exactly. <laughs> you have the best laugh. Have you ever thought about doing voiceover work or commercials? I haven't thought about it. Well, if this, but, you know, uh, this doctor thing doesn't work out, you know. <laughs> well, the, the way the insurance industry is working, you never know. You may see me in this uh, not too <laughs> not too distant future. <laughs> that would be great. Okay, so here's a question. Thank you guys for the questions. Uh, what, so you, Struthi says, do you have suggestions on how I can stop picking after dinner? And I assume picking meaning picking at food, not your skin, I'm guessing. Wow. You know, it's it's a interesting question. A simple thing to do is to find other things to do. So if you're if you're snacking after dinner, what you may want to do is create other activities that keeps you away from the kitchen. Maybe it's going for a walk or some light exercise. It's not anything that's going to keep you awake all night, but uh, create other activities that take you away from from uh, the kitchen. So maybe create little miniature social events, talk to someone on the phone or something. I'm not sure. But those are some things that you can do. Yeah. And that, this, um, that, that's probably the one of the worst times to eat extra calories, isn't it? After, yep. after dinner. Yep. And, yep. And, and to some extent, we tell our people are losing too much weight. Okay. Go ahead and eat a little bit extra after dinner. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, eat right, but eat right before laying down. That would yeah. Be Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Donald says, wow. Let's just say 93. You're 93. Wow. I'm glad you're watching. I went from 135 to 109 after hip replacement and I can't gain any weight back. Any recommendations? Um, you're going to have to get with a trainer and work on strength training. Uh, now you may not regain the girth, but, um, you know, hopefully you've had adequate physical therapy to where you're mobile on the new hip, but you want to work on st strength training. Nice. Let's drop over to Instagram. I'm changing screens to see if there's any questions there. Okay. Do you, do you still do like, like these programs? You used to do them like they were like four, I think they were either boot camps, like four weeks or eight weeks. Remember? I, I don't know if mm -hmm. you still do those. Oh yes, we have them and they're online. In fact, it's a healthy lifestyle series. Um, I'll post a link in the, the chat. I don't know if they can see the chat from the. Um... Um, I can see the chat and then I can post it in where, where people can see it and put it in the show notes. OK, what I'll do is I'm going to put it. Uh, I'm going to show the link to the healthy lifestyle series. Give me a minute here. Yeah, Take your time. There you go. And so that's one of our program. That's the one where you have, it's a live interaction. Our team will coach you through a detox. And it's, it's like five sessions over four weeks. 
and you get recipes. There's a, there are a lot of uh, resources there. It's one of our flagship programs. Yeah, thanks. Here's a question from um, Janet. Is it common for elderly people to lose their appetite and get full when eating even small amounts of food? I'm asking for my mom who's 90. She eats whole food, plant-based, no oil for over six years. BMI is 20. She's active and healthy. You know, it is uh, common for people to lose their appetite, but I'm not sure if it's a, a loss of appetite or it's just, you know, you're more satisfied. So yes, she's active, uh, but maybe, you know, her caloric needs have decreased over the years. Um, what we found in our study, this isn't looking at, this was an elderly population, but we found in our study, uh, when we looked at it, I'm trying to remember the, the average age was somewhere close to 60, if I remember correctly. Um, but there was a natural reduction in caloric intake, even though we asked them to eat at libidum, uh, when they went from their standard American diet to a plant-based diet. And, and, and they were satisfied. In fact, you know, we provided the meals. They couldn't even finish all the meals. And so what we found is that you have a decreased caloric intake naturally because you're getting high nutrient density. And so it's really the brain, the biochemistry of the brain and the rest of the body that's saying, okay, uh, we've reached you know, capacity or we've uh, had our needs satisfied and then the hunger gets turned off. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, because the food is so filling because, you know, when you think about it, processed foods and animal products, they neither of them have fiber or water and fiber and water is what make you feel full. And that's what plants are is, I mean, unless they're, you know, as Dr. Goldhammer says, beating, heating and treating them, you know, dehydrating them and things like that, you know, and techniques that remove the water like air frying, you know. So, you know, that that's something it's interesting because I just thought of this because I, I do teach my still do teach weight loss classes. And one of the coaches was doing a PowerPoint on Saturday and what she had done, because people keep asking us, well, how do you calculate the calorie density of certain foods? And we're like, don't worry about it. Just eat fruits, vegetables, whole grains and legumes. You don't have to worry about it. Because like you say, when you're eating the right food, those don't have to be weighed and measured. But she did that and she took the same meal where she took it was either a potato or a sweet potato and she cooked it with a wet cooking method and like, you know, like steaming, for example. And then she, she steamed the vegetables and then she air fried everything. And what was interesting is it, it didn't change the calories as long as the food was the same, but it changed the volume. And so in other words, when, when she air fried the potatoes and air fried the broccoli, the plate of food was much smaller. Mm. And, and, and it was the same calories. And that's why, like, it, I, so my suggestion for people that are trying to gain weight, maybe change the cooking method, because it's a lot easier to eat a bunch of air fried French fries than it is a bunch of, you know, steamed potatoes, because mm. water's been removed, and you can get more calories that way. Yeah, and it's, it goes for dehydration too. you know, the air frying, I haven't looked into that too much. You, uh, maybe I'll throw the question in your direction that if you, I don't know if uh, Greg or anyone looked at studies with air frying, is it I know the temperature is higher than dehydration. Uh, enzymes are killed, but what what's the scoop on air dry air fry? Right. You know what? I have something from Gregor about that, that it's basically like when we asked him this, and this was years ago when we started getting into air frying. And he said, you know, unless you're air frying animal products, it's, you know, an oil, it's safe. But if you, if you can talk for, you know, a little bit, I can actually search that and find that actual art article from the medical journal that he sent me. It's going to take me a moment. So let me read. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. Gonna, and and uh, email that to me. That's, that'd be great to look at air frying because we, our cooking techniques, they range from, of course, the raw prep. Uh, we do dehydration, which is similar to air frying, except the temperatures are lower. And so you, in theory, maintain at least uh, the viability of the enzymes within the food. Uh, the downside of dehydration is that you're removing water. And water is probably one of the more important aspects of certain foods, for certain, for sure. And uh, on some foods are, are, have low water content to start with. So it may not matter too much if they're dehydrated or not dehydrated. Uh, the air frying, of course, is dehydration with a higher temperature. So the differential there is that you, you may not have uh, maintained enzyme integrity. And also the, the biochemical architecture of the food may not be the same. Uh, and so you may lose that. 
So then the question becomes, okay, if I take a, uh, a potato and boil it and mash it versus dehydrate it or air fry it, uh, which is healthier, one would suggest that maybe boil or eating it raw for that matter uh, is even healthier. Uh, but then, okay, fine. But if I air fry it to, to satisfy my palate, what amount of harm am I doing? Well, I'm taking away the hydration. So, okay, um, I'm, I'm losing that. But is it as detrimental as if I'm frying it in oil? Probably not. Is it as detrimental as uh, maybe white microwaving it? I don't know. Probably not. I don't know. So, you know, I think a lot of science has to be done and we have to look at this from the context of whole pa patients. Uh, I'm anxious to see this article that uh, Dr. Gregor came up with, but we deal with these questions on a regular basis from the standpoint of, okay, what cooking method uh, are we dealing with? Because ideally you want to just eat food as, as the same as you harvest it from the ground. But uh, most of us in transition, we're, you know, dealing with social settings and things like that. Um, and, and Dr. Reese Latham, I think, um, I like the way he put it. Uh, he says uh, a lot of these foods, now he's not talking about the real bad animal food, but the, 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 the vegan food that's gourmet and dehydrated, uh, he refers to it as entertainment. <laughs> and so, so we're dealing with entertaining food. And so, um, Air frying is probably along those lines, but but it's something that I think if you're you're trying to um, um, maintain a certain amount of pleasure uh, or um, connect with a certain amount of pleasure you've become accustomed to over your life and without doing too much harm, uh, I think one can use air frying within the context of a healthy diet within reason. Uh, my take on it is simply always measure the outcome. Uh, the outcome is gonna be important largely because uh, if you have a health condition and you're eating natural raw plant foods, you're air frying some, and your health condition continues to recede or your overall health continues to improve, well, guess what? You know, you know, continue to enjoy the air frying. Uh, however, if your health condition is so brittle to where even a little bit of air frying is going to cause regression, then you need to hold off on air frying until your health condition got to a point where you built up reserve where you can tolerate. So it's all a matter of looking at where the individual is uh, and what the um, uh, what you're trying to accomplish. You know, that makes sense. And I did find the article and I'm going to email it to you and I can even awesome. put show notes, but I had corresponded with Dr. Greger and this is dated April 14th, 2018. So six wow. oh almost six years ago. And I asked him, is air frying bad? Because that's when we all started getting into using the Breville. And of course, we're using it without animal products and oil. And then his response was, it's only bad if you air fry sardines. And then he sent me an article called The Impact of Air Frying on Cholesterol and Fatty Acid Oxidation. Mm. So we'll, we'll get that for you. And of course, you know, if, if things change, you know, he, he'll change his mind. But I was just mentioning it because when, when people are saying they can't lose weight, what would I tell them or they can't gain weight? I say, we'll just do the opposite of everything I say, you know, you eat, eat the nut seeds, avocado, use the techniques that take the water out and the fiber out, you know, bread, for example, versus versus whole grains and things like that. But I think people focus sometimes on this minutia, uh, like they get upset, like, like, for instance, I, I, I had a birthday recently. And I posted that I went out to this restaurant and had sushi, which is a vegan sushi, of course, okay. you know, and it's really happy birthday, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And, you know, and people were like, I can't believe you eat white rice. And it's like, I've always eaten white rice. And that's never been the reason that I was unhealthy when I was unhealthy. And that was never the reason I was overweight. You know, I'm sure you're familiar with Dr. Walter Kempner, right? Yep. The Kempner diet. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Rice and fruit and rice. Have you ever, have you ever resorted to that with any of your patients? We actually experimented with that for a short period of time. We didn't use it long enough to really get uh, results, but uh, we did experiment with it. Uh, one of these days, you ain't going to test it in one of our trials. Yeah, because it's, it, I mean, it, he, he his patients lost a lot of weight and reversed their diabetes. So, I, you know, maybe it's not the ideal food, but it's, it's not it's not why people are overweight, at least in my experience. It's what they usually put on it. 
Okay, yep. so um, this was a question. I'm sorry, because my chat goes quickly. Sandra says, I've been vegetarian. So that's not vegan. That could be animal yeah. products. <laughs> See, that's a clue right there when she says, yeah. for over 20 years and have osteoporosis. I don't know if I'm doing something wrong that went from osteoporosis to osteopenia. So you're saying vegetarian and you're not saying vegan and animal products are not good for this in my uh, understanding, but I'll let Dr. Montgomery answer. Yeah, I was seeing a patient just the other day. Uh, maybe I was talking to her on the phone, I can't remember. But she was saying, yeah, I've been vegetarian for you know maybe two decades and and uh, she consumed a lot of cheese and she had a calcium score. I think I was talking to someone on the phone that was over 2,100, uh, over 1,400. But uh, yeah, but she consumed a lot of cheese. So yeah, the vegetarian diet, and, you know, it's really strange because the labels, oftentimes people are going to say, well, I'm vegan, I'm vegetarian. I say, okay, that's great, but tell me what you're eating. Because um, it, the labels are misused often. And sometimes people say they're vegan and vegetarian is eating fish once a week. So, I, yeah, you know, I'll just say, okay, what are you eating? <laughs> so, and how are you preparing it? Yeah, absolutely. What do you eat? Do you eat mostly raw still? I know that for a while you were maybe even 100% raw, I think, when I met you. I go to a phase where I'm 100% raw. It could be for a month. I went for two years at one point and and uh, I eat mostly raw. I eat a fair amount of cooked food. So I keep it to where my mornings are like hydrating foods, whether it's a cold pressed juice or smoothie or uh, some fruit that's hydrating. It's going to flush my system out. Uh, then salads are mixed in there and then I'll eat soups, uh, you know, that are warm or hot soups and things like that. So, yeah, well, you're lucky cause your office actually has a restaurant in it. <laughs> yep. 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 We do gourmet raw. They made me some, uh, a raw, uh, uh, tahini wrap and of course my green smoothies and I'll get the raw salad or raw pizza, whatever the case may be. Oh, that sounds delicious. I don't know if you're familiar with Lissa Maris of Raw Food Romance, but she makes just the most delicious gourmet raw food. She's going to be visiting me next month and I cannot wait. She may, Oh, you got to get her wrap book. She makes wraps, but they're low calorie density wraps and they're hundred percent raw. And she makes them out of things like fruits and vegetables. And they're just the most delicious thing I've ever eaten. Email me a link to her. Does she have a YouTube channel or what? She sure does. She has. She was on yesterday. She's on my show the the second Tuesday of every month, and she's just her food is just it's beautiful, and it's just I think you'd really like her. Actually, Give me her YouTube channel. I'll I'll, I'll uh, subscribe and and yes, yeah. I'll take. What I was saying, if you have the dehydrate, because you know it's funny because I told Dr. Goldhammer about about her, and they have a dehydrator at True North, and he, he actually personally bought her wrap book, and now the chef is making them because as you know, like bread is very calorically dense and it's not super healthy and so now with these wraps people can have like you know the feeling of picking something up and eating you know sandwich like but they're basically made out of fruits and vegetables and they're low in fat there's about two tablespoons of, of chia or flax seeds in each one that she puts in not for the nutritional benefits but for the pliability and boy i, I just wish i had somebody to make it for me you know Yep. Yeah, we make the, our wraps out of tahini. It's, made, it's a, a combination of coconut meat and ceiling husk. And then we have other wraps uh, and breads that are just out of seeds. Um, oh, nice. And so, uh, but yeah, but no, you're right. It's great. Uh, but I, I, I like to look at uh, her yeah. channel. It's Hers are life. very, they're pliable and they're just so unique. Some, some are made out of blue spirulina, purple sweet potatoes. I think you'd like her. So uh, Sandra was saying no animal products, stop eating cheese this year, no eggs. But but see, all the 20 years that she was a vegetarian, she was apparently eating cheese. And you had mentioned that can make her osteoporosis worse, right? That's right. Yeah. So there, there, there should be some recovery time. The key with the osteoporosis, you have to do weight weight training too. Uh, fresh air, sunshine, weight training is going to be because she needs to get stronger, get a trainer uh, and lift weights and exercise, build up muscle mass, build up the stress on those joints and muscles so that they can start to heal themselves. Thank you. I'm going to let you go. I know you're a busy doctor. I'm just going to read this comment from Tracy. Dr. Montgomery, in one of your podcast interviews, you mentioned a green powder to an ICU patient. I've been trying to find out what this is. Is an ICU RN. I wish I had which we'd give better nutrition to our tube fed patients. Yeah. So there's a product. Uh, we don't use it much anymore. I can show the ones that we currently use. Uh, I'm going to send a link 
So what we use, uh, one of the green powders is one of several that we use, but this is one that's very good. I'll show, hold on one second here, because I'll and, send you the link. And while you do that, I'm going to put the link to your uh, boot camp in the chat on both Instagram and on YouTube. And I'll also put it in the show notes. There we go. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, you know what? I did, I did, are you familiar with thylakoids? No. Okay, so I, I wrote about this briefly in my book, The Secret to Ultimate Weight Loss, which actually your endorsement, I think, if I remember correctly, you made the cover. Let me see, because I remember you had a you had a great endorsement of that book. And I put the link to our premium greens. That's one of the super greens that we use, and that would work very well with the ICU patients. Nice. Actually, your endorsement did of my book, The Secret to Ultimate Weight Loss, did make the cover. But anyway, um, I talked about it briefly, but then luckily Dr. Greger's book, How Not to Diet, was a, a you know New York Times bestseller, and people got familiar more with this term thylakoids. But there, there are these compounds that are found only in plants, specifically like the cruciferous dark green leafies. And apparently they just blunt your hunger. You know, they just turn off the hunger switch. They block fat absorption. And so, you know, I, green juices are super healthy and I love them. And I just actually got a, a, a one of those, those cool juicers that you... I forget the kind that everybody likes. It's a knockoff of the Nama J2 because the Nama J2 is like 600 bucks. This was uh, much portable. It was like 150. I'm going to feature it. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. One, and, and it's portable. Like you can travel with it. So as soon as I figure out how to use it, I'm going to actually ask the company try best to be on the show. But when I drink, I love green juice, but when I drink it, it blunts my appetite so much and that I, I, I'm not hungry. So what I'm saying is that like, for people that are struggling to lose weight. That's why I always recommend vegetables first and vegetables in the, in the morning, because those greens just make you not crave sugar and not so hungry. Well, they satisfy you nutritionally. And so it's the biochemical exactly. effects of it. And so it's, you know, if your body's nourished biochemically, uh, you know, that's the, 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 you know, the, the crux of the matter. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I I didn't meet you, but the first time I saw you, you were you were uh, being awarded a, an award by PCRM. It was called the Dr. Spock Award. It was somewhere, yeah. I think, in Marina Del Rey. It was definitely in Los Angeles. And you had been on my radar since then. And I'm getting a one award in a couple of weeks from Dr. Neil Barnard. He's coming out to Sacramento to give me one called the Voice of Compassion Award. So, oh, wow. Yeah, Congratulations. So we'll, yeah, we'll have something in common. Awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. If you do something long enough, people notice, I guess. Well, thank you, Dr. Montgomery. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Likewise. And thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and your wonderful audience. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 o'clock for Vegan Doc Talk with Dr. Scott Harrington, and he's going to answer your questions. Take